Hello, I'm Charlotte Mamus, and thank you for coming to be with us again on Artworks. This program has been going on now, soon to be two years, and we are so excited because we have yet to repeat a program or a style of art in our wonderful, wonderful region and community. Today is certainly not going to be anything more than that because this is going to be a real fascinating program that you may not even know a thing about. Many of you will, but many of you will not. But I'm standing by someone who is extremely important to this town of ours, and this is a beautiful sculpture of the Duke of Albemarle. And back, he was made famous to us back when we had a big celebration, and this beautiful sculpture has been made by Roger Martin, who is right here in Albemarle, and we're standing in his gallery on East Main Street, and we're going to talk to Roger about how he got started, his lifetime of following his passion, how this process works, the beautiful pieces that he has in, this, in the gallery, and where they are, they're scattered not only in Albemarle, but isn't it wonderful to know that we have something like this. So this is the Roger Martin Sculpture Gallery on East Main Street. So I want you to sit back. You are going to be surprised at what we're going to show you today and I know you're going to enjoy it. And we will start our tour and tell you a little bit more about this fascinating, fascinating passion that Roger has and what he has developed in his lifetime. So sit back and enjoy. As I mentioned earlier in the introduction, we have another wonderful program for you today. Thank you so much for telling us constantly how much you learn about Stanley County from the programs. And I can assure you that you're going to learn something new today because it is a, a wonderful addition to the arts in Stanley County that gets extended into other states, other communities, and that is Roger Martin's gallery, a sculpture gallery. Roger, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you, Charlotte. Glad to be, glad to have you here. Oh, I'm yeah. glad to be here. It's an exciting time because we've been planning this for a long time. Thank and uh, as I mentioned earlier, you are a sculptor and there are not those on every corner. No, I think we're probably the only one on East Main Street. You're the only one yeah. on East Main Street. Yeah. And we are delighted that you're here and that you have allowed us to come in and talk with you and we're going to walk around and look at some pieces on during the show but let's talk about you just a little bit okay how was it that you and your family came to albemarle um in my dad was the uh, assistant superintendent of schools in gaston county and i think in about 1975 uh, we moved um, moved here Dad was the uh, super, became the superintendent of Stanley County Schools, and so I went to uh, uh, ninth grade. Went to what was the middle school, uh, just up the street here. Then uh, went to uh, Albemarle High School, uh, uh, Albemarle Senior High back uh -huh. then, and uh, uh, graduated from uh, senior high. So I spent some spent some time here going to school, and um, so. Uh, wasn't born here, but I've been here a long time. You're kind of like the old saying, you weren't born here, but you got here mm. about as fast as fast you could. As fast as I could. That's well, exactly for right. people like me, uh, and you and I have had this conversation, and there will be many people in our audience who will agree, that we remember well when your family came, and uh, your dad being superintendent of schools, your mom being a teacher, and how much they loved this community, and we all loved them. And well, Thank uh, you. And it's good. You're... you're uh, Staying here and being part of this community is very important to us. Right. So that let's talk about then a little bit how you got into being a sculptor. Well, I um, always had an interest in animals and sort of three-dimensional things more than 
I'm not sure I can draw stick people, so I, I had to figure out something else. Uh, I, was, I grew up when I was in Gastonia. I grew up um, down oh, probably a half a mile from the Shield Museum mm -hmm. in uh, Gastonia and was introduced, you know, saw taxidermy there and saw animals. And I thought, you know, didn't um, most of my, I'd say most of my life and success has been built on the fact that I didn't know I couldn't do something, so you just go ahead and do it anyway. Um, but um, the, so I taught myself to do taxidermy when I was about 12 and was interested in animals. So um, did that, and after I graduated from high school here in Albemarle, I, went, I moved back to Gastonia and uh, went to Gaston College and worked uh, in the Shield Museum. Um, after uh, a couple of years there, was interested in doing uh, the mannequins or the forms for the taxidermy industry. So uh, that type of sculpture is where you would start if you were doing a taxidermy mannequin, which a taxidermist would use to put the skin over for a mounted bear or a deer or whatever. Uh, we, um, you'd start with the skeleton of the animal and set up this entire skeleton and do a clay sculpture over top of that skeleton to produce an anatomical sculpture of a bear, a deer, or whatever the animal might be. And so, um, so I started doing that. Uh, ended up uh, back in Albemarle starting a business um, in the early 80s, uh, manufacturing these taxidermy sculptures. Actually, uh, trying to think, started in this building and um, probably about 1981 or 82, somewhere in there. So. Uh, so I started manufacturing, basically plastics manufacturing, manufacturing these animal sculptures that I had done. And um, so always, you know, as technically always making a living as a sculptor just in, in different ways. And uh, built a, a company, I guess 20 years, had the company 20 years and then sold the company. And um, I still work for them doing product development. Uh, and but was more interested in bronze sculpture and ended up uh, pursuing that. So I'm, st I'm doing both, still doing all those things. I had forgotten that. I had forgotten yes. about the business. I think I remember something about that. Yes. And that's interesting because you were just developing your passion. Yes. And you did it in incrementally and uh, got the depth of the, of the whole idea. Right. I think that's amazing. Well, that's I feel amazing. very lucky that I was able to do something that I enjoyed doing. Uh, to make a living all those years and, and have a, um, you know, career, a career in that and then be able to take that to the next step. Take that to the next step. To the next step into fine art. Yes. Well, there's something to be said, and we hear this all the time, about loving our work. Absolutely. And uh, when we love our work, it, it is a joy. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, I know that's true with you. I think the most wonderful thing is that you have been able to take your passion and you do shows, and you teach, and you do things. I know you're on a heavy travel schedule. Oh, yes. And you uh, go to other parts of the country and take it. And that's the beauty of this program, is how we have been able to introduce or to at least be able to let people in our community know all the wonderful things that go on here yeah. in the arts. And there are so many different kinds of arts. Tell us a little bit about some of the things that you do when you leave Albemarle and you go out of state somewhere. Um, part of you know the the art uh, pushing the art scene and trying to see what you can do there. Uh, part of that is there's different things. You have uh, shows that you do where you take you take your sculptures or your paintings and you go to a show and set up a display and it may be at a, um, you know, an annual show that that you participate in and it's basically a selling show and you go there for a you know for the for the weekend or the week and uh, it could be anywhere in the country there's lots mm -hmm. of art shows fine art shows that go on there's also juried shows that are museum juried shows where you might enter one you might enter three pieces and then if you get selected you might get one piece in and it may um, go on tour um, around the country for a year um, and then I was just in a jury, I mean, in a uh, museum show in uh, Irving, Texas, uh, was with um, six other artists, and that was a, uh, a museum show. So there's different types of shows, and I still, um, you know, just participating in those shows and trying to get uh, more exposure and uh, connection with uh, selling art and improving my art. I think that's amazing. Do you do commissioned pieces? 
Uh, do some. I don't do. Uh, my time is so limited. Mm -hmm. I don't do many anymore because I'm just getting very. Uh, as I get older, I get very stingy with my time, and well, that's okay. I, and it's that thing of um, I sort of want to do what I want to do. Well, I but I, I still do. Okay. I still that's do fine. some. There's, uh, you know, I did a piece for the um, of the uh, Duke of Albemarle for this that's at the City Hall. Right. I remember um, that. Have a couple of there's several commission pieces and in we'll, here that I've yeah, cast. We'll, so we'll talk, talk about, about that. We'll talk about some of those later. But yeah, occasionally, I'll, if it's based on basically, it's one of those. If it's something I really want to do and it's a, a subject or uh, a concept that I'd like to do, then it's fine. But uh, um, I like to do what I want to do. So. Well, I think that's great because I think that's part of, of uh, being able to do what your passion is and yes. enjoying what you do. And uh, it's okay to be stingy with our time. You're you're doing that in the right way because you're <laughs> you're being selective about right, how you spend right. your time. And I think that's great. When you have the opportunity to talk with. Uh, younger children may be in a museum or they yeah. come in or there's a show what what is it that they want to know how did you how did you do this uh, what kind of excitement do you see maybe with the younger adults or younger children well the, i think there's an interest in um you know how do you make this you know mm -hmm. painting you see um where you take paint and you paint it on a canvas and it makes you it's very easy to see how you go from this step to that step that's right uh, you know pottery you can you take the clay and you turn right. the pot and you fire it and you've got um you know the bronze sculpture is a little more confusing because you start you have so many positives and negatives with molds and casts and all these things mm -hmm. it's a it's a fairly complicated process it's it hasn't changed that much in other through other than technology and how to melt metal and those sorts of things it really isn't that much difference than what was being done you know three four hundred years ago or you know back even thousands of years ago pouring mm -hmm. pouring metal but um, it's a little more complicated because the clay sculpture that you create that we can talk about later upstairs is is not any part of the finished product it's what you use to make the mold that you do the casting and and so a lot of people uh, especially children want to see and young people want to how do you get from okay you might be working on a clay sculpture mm -hmm. at a show and they want to say well how do you get from this point to that point and uh, trying to explain that is, is usually the big question how do you how do you get there oh, and sometimes you know how do you come up with the idea how do you how do you know what you want to do right. and that sort of thing but a lot of cases it's simply the technology of the technique of getting from clay to the finished metal piece well that's the reason I asked that because I know that 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 children are so inquisitive and yes. adults are inquisitive oh, yes. we want to know how did you get from here to here and especially as you said we have already done programs on painters and we've done them on potters and now we wanted to make sure that we advanced into <laughs> sculpturing and it's all such a different medium and people are wanting to know how you do that so that the next time they see a piece of your work or someone else's work, they right. will have a greater appreciation okay. for uh, what you do. We are going to walk around and look at some pieces and look maybe at some processing. Okay. So I want, to, and we'll talk as we go along, but I wanted there are people to know up first and up front uh, where you are, that your, that your gallery is located on East Main Street right here in downtown Albemarle. And I'm sure that People have been by and said, I wonder what that is. So that's the whole purpose today is to introduce them to you and to your wonderful art and to let them know what is in this building. So why don't we walk around a little bit and let's see what else we can talk about. That sounds great. Okay. As I mentioned, we were going to walk around through the studio and through the gallery, and we're on that tour right now. And Roger, we're in the studio where it all happens. That's right. So what I'd like for you to tell us is what goes on in here and what's going on in here right now. Uh, well, Charlotte, this is, this is the uh, clay sculpture of a red fox that I'm working on. This is still in a non-hardening modeling clay. Uh, this would be a life-size red fox. Uh, when I'm working on a piece, I generally have an idea of 
Um, basically what it will, it's going to be, what size it's going to be, but I don't, I'm not confining myself to an absolute this is what the pose is going to be. People ask me a lot, do you work from a photograph, did you copy, you know, is this a picture t you took somewhere? Not usually. I mean, I'll have pictures of foxes, but it's for ears and legs and different things like that. I'll build an armature like a skeleton, so there's wires in here, sort of like a skeleton, and there's a piece of plywood and wires that come out the tail. And actually, I even built up the tail with aluminum foil to bulk it out and then covered that with clay. It all has to be structurally sound so it'll hold up. And then uh, working with this armature, I bend and move and and keep trying different poses until I come up with, well, that's, that's the composition that I want to pull off. And, and the artsy thing about it is I'm always looking at negative spaces, what angles are created here. Right now I'm working on, I'm mocking up the base for this piece. I'm just cutting it out of cardboard. This will be fairly geometric. And I'm, it's, I'll uh, first work it out in cardboard, and uh, then later, once I get the design worked out where I want it to be, then I'll make it out of wood covered in clay and that sort of thing. So once the design is completely done and all the clay is finished, uh, then uh, to do the casting process, I will actually cut this clay model into pieces. This, the tail will be cut off, the legs will be cut off, it'll be cut into pieces, and then actually the, the uh, parts will be molded in silicone rubber. So I'll make a silicone rubber mold of all these different pieces. Then that goes to the foundry. First, you, you, the process is referred to as lost wax bronze casting. That's the technical term for you know, most bronze sculpture, the way it's done. So the lost wax, and a lot of jewelry is made this way as well. Out of, it's, done, you know, it's done in wax. So from this rubber mold, we make a wax casting. It's sort of like a, it's a hollow casting, like a chocolate Easter bunny, sort of. You know, it's hollow mm -hmm. on the inside. So you have wax castings of all these pieces. Then from there, they make a ceramic mold where it's dipped in a ceramic shell material over and over till it builds up about a half an inch thick. You have to make a ceramic shell mold of all these pieces. Then that goes into a furnace. And the, once the ceramic shell is done, it goes into a furnace at about 1,500 degrees, and then they burn out the wax. It fires the shell. It's like a piece of porcelain, like, like a plate mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. So because you have to create a mold that can withstand the 2,000 degree heat of the molten bronze. If you just poured the molten bronze in the rubber mold, it'd just burn up. it just disintegrate. So, so you make the ceramic mold. You have the, um, the uh, shell mold made burn the wax out, then that's what the molten bronze is poured into. So the bronze casting, you end up with all these pieces of, of cast bronze. Once the bronze cools off, then the shell is broken away and you have these bronze castings. Now, if all these legs and pieces are cut apart, they have to be welded back together. So the tail would be welded back, and it's all hollow. So, you know, we have all these hollow pieces that we've cast, like back like the chocolate Easter bunny, but mm -hmm. it's now bronze instead of wax. Um, we weld all these pieces back together and any place that it's, if there's a weld here, then you have to come back and grind that weld so that you can't see, uh, see where it was and, and it you know, goes away so it looks like it's all one continuous piece again. Once all the metal work is done, then the different colors that we'll see later when we go downstairs and look through the gallery, um, the different colors, the different patinas are produced by heating the metal. Uh, depends on you know, 350, 450 degrees with a big torch. You heat the metal up and different chemicals applied to the metal will oxidize the metal, creating different colors. Uh, so you'll see silver, you'll see green, you'll see brown, you'll see all, the, all those different colors are created by the oxidization I think I said that correctly. <laughs> they, I think uh, so. Yeah, I think so. We'll stick with that. Uh, don't anybody Google it. Um, yeah. So um, the, um, the, you know, that's what creates the different colors, by, depending on what order you put them on, what temperature you put them on, all these different effects. A lot like what you see in pottery and ceramics, mm -hmm. you know, the, the uh, firing and mm -hmm. getting the, uh, the colors there. It's kind of a, kind of a similar thing there. So uh, that's kind of the process. Uh, as far as style, you know, I, I sculpt, did sculptures of uh, tax for taxidermy mannequins for years. I did anatomical studies. So I really wanted to do something different. I like to do a very um, stylized uh, textures. I really work on textures. To me, texture is about reflection of light, not just creating a, um, 
a, a facsimile of fur. I want to mm -hmm. actually, just like a diamond is cut mm -hmm. or a jewel is cut, mm -hmm. I want these shapes so that, especially if this is installed outside, it will reflect light and as you walk around it, it will uh, uh, actually, a lot of these things will actually make it look softer than something that's sculpted just to look exactly like the actual animal's fur. Because actual animal's fur is soft and has depth to it, it it's not the same thing. So, uh, and trying to develop a recognizable style, that's I think what every artist wants to do. If you see, most people who uh, know fine art, if you see a painting, even if you don't know who did it, if you see the style, you go, oh, that must be a Picasso mm -hmm. because I recognize mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. style. So every artist is generally working towards that goal. What a process. It, I mean, it's so many, has so many steps. So from the time you started, the very, very first steps that you've walked us through now, yes, yes. to get to this point, and then to get to the finished product, uh, I know you're doing other things in the, in the meantime, yes. but at the same time, what's a time frame for? Well, I always have to throw in the fact that I've been uh, practicing and sculpting for 30 years. You know, that the, know. Gotta, know you that. have to work that part in there as well. I know but, that. but as far as process, uh, you know, I might actually, you know, like you said, I, I have multiple pieces going on mm -hmm. at one time. I'm, I'm a bit ADD and I well, bounce around. <laughs> so, I know the feeling. <laughs> so, uh, so I, um, uh, actual time on a clay model, I'll work on one on and off for. Oh, at least six months. I work okay. on it a while. I get to the point mm -hmm. with that, and then work on another one. But actual time on that particular piece, I mean, it's it's still uh, weeks of it's actual very time. time, very time consuming. consuming. I'll have, um, I mean, I might get a, and it looks like uh, Gina will come in and she's like, "Oh, that's about done," and then I'll spend, you know, have another 150 hours in it because it's like it's it, it's sort of like building a house. You know, you get a house built. And it looks like you know it's all. It looks like a house now, but then finishing it takes so much That's time. Right. Doing all the and and working out toes and working out shapes and and working out all these angles, um, getting and actually getting to this part point to me is about the quickest. It's from here, here it's from to the here end. Out. Yeah, that takes the longest. Really I working and fine tuning so. those sorts of things. Well, and you see, you're seeing what you want there. Right. Where I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at the product that I'm seeing in front of me right now. But then, as you've pointed out, I began to see the detail, and I know, you know, in your mind, you're seeing it all the way through. Oh, it's just amazing. Do you have something else you want to show uh, us and yes. what we've got going on here? Uh, we can look at these otters. Oh, um, yes. Let's look at them. And this is a piece that uh, is roughed out kind of the same point. I was trying to get several pieces roughed out. They still need fingers and toes and, you know, uh, details. but. I'm wor I was working on the composition. I had this done originally with just two otters, and it just wasn't enough, so I added this third otter in there. And a lot of it is, you know, the composition. You know, working on this piece, I actually set the heads up. I wanted this, this triangular shape of these heads, and then I sort of filled in the bodies. When I built this one, his head was out here in space, and it's like, okay, that head's got to be right there, and I've got to figure out an otter that'll connect to that spot. Well, they just look like they're supposed to be that way. Well, and I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, composition is important. Uh, you know, I do uh, pieces, you know, outdoor pieces that end up uh, installed uh, in public places right. and trying to come up with something that, um, you know, there's a lot of wildlife art out there. Lots and lots and lots of wildlife art. So the challenge to me as an artist is how do you take the same old stuff, the same otters, the same foxes, and do something different something with it? Different. That's the challenge. If you know, if you're just going to do another bear or deer just like everybody else did, there's, you know, that's, there's just not much yes. point in that. Well, so how do you absolutely. take the same things and do something different? And that's where um, a piece like this is with the composition, I think, is, is trying to pull that off. I think it's just amazing, and I love the openness of your studio with the light, and you can see out through the town, and and yet it's private for you, and you're not in. I just that, that attracted me when I walked in. That it, what a great place to <laughs> hang out, as you said. Yes. Well, that. anything else you want to show us about the process here? I know we're going to look at some finished products, and uh, I think that's about okay, it. Okay. Well, and I think this gives our people watching this show a good idea of the beginning of getting to a finished product and the time it takes and the creativity. So why don't we then move around and we'll watch, go downstairs, walk downstairs and see some of the finished products. How about that? Yes. Is that Sounds good? Great. Sounds okay. great. Well, Roger, we have been upstairs. We've looked at how this all begins. 
And I will have to admit to you and to the audience that I'm amazed at the process that you start from the inspiration to the, and the time it takes. Now we're down in this beautiful gallery, which is used for special events, and you have uh, people come in some time for it. Of course, it's by appointment only. And uh, I've been here for a couple of those, and it just makes a wonderful showing in place. And this, this wonderful frog here in the middle of the gallery just got my attention real early. Let's talk about this frog. Well, uh, Charlotte, this frog was uh, a neighbor of mine. Um, she, uh, Sandy Rogers, actually. I, well, I think it's yeah, okay to okay. say, <laughs> say her right, name. Yeah. She won't um, care. She won't care, yeah. She actually approached me about doing something for their, uh, for their backyard. So I thought, well, I need to, I'd like to do a big frog. Back to doing commissions if it's something I want to do. Yeah. So Sandy twisted my arm, taught me in doing this frog. So uh, this is Jeremiah. And yeah. she wanted something to go in the yard. And I thought she had some uh, uh, on a wall behind, you know, in the backyard. She, um, we looked around and said, well, you know, something would be nice on the, on the top of that wall. So back to the preface of how do we do something different? You know, how do you come up Not with something? Not just frogs. Not there. just another frog. So came up with a design where the, the legs hanging down and, um, you know, trying to, and also trying to take that frog and, and twist him and turn him and do his, sort of like the fox upstairs. How mm -hmm, do you get as much mm -hmm, action and, mm -hmm. and um, twisting and turning things to make it interesting other than, you know, just, just a frog. This piece is, is very anatomically accurate. It's like a, a three and a half times uh, life size enlargement of a, uh, I'm sorry, five and a half times enlargement of an actual bullfrog. And I had one and I made measurements of, of this bullfrog so that all these joints would be accurate. Frogs and t turtles and things like that tend to go cartoonish looking really easy. Mm -hmm. So I wanted this to be um, very accurate. I took you know a few artistic liberties with some of the bulges and uh, things, but like a lot of the children like to ask, well, what is this? Well, that's the uh, the top of the pelvis um, on a frog. That's mm. that's the reason they can jump so far is because these are muscles that attach uh, okay. there. But you know all these points using these things to make a make the sculpture interesting, but yet still have a frog and. Um, you know, that was, I think. Well, he Jeremiah is quite a character. I really like him a lot. And I'm sure Sandy is happy with her Jeremiah yes, that I she think. has, which leads me to what we just discussed earlier, that once you do the mold, then you can replicate and you can make more Jeremiah. Yes, this piece, uh, most of the sculptures that I do are uh, limited edition. So like with this piece, it's limited to 15. So um, the, as we talked about in the molding process where the silicone mold is made, that's the part that you can use over and over again. Uh, the whole rest of making the ceramic mold, all those things, mm -hmm. that all gets destroyed in the, in the process. So the only thing that's saved is the silicone rubber mold. So. You go back to that mold if you need an, another one for the addition, uh, make the wax again, you do the ceramic mold, go through the whole thing. So that enables you to make multiple Jeremiah's. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this piece is uh, just about to sell out, and so this is one, there's this one and one other one in the addition. And um, so at that point, once that once last one's gone. cast, then the mold is destroyed yeah. and that's it. Smaller pieces, they may be an addition of, of 30 or 40, but mm -hmm. the bigger pieces are, are more limited than that. Well, I'm so glad we talked about him because he really got my attention in, uh, when we came in. And I know, I look around in the, in the gallery the times I have been in here and today, and the diversity of what you do. Right. Uh, you do so many, many different uh, things you uh, like this piece. I don't remember this piece from before, but now it's got my attention today. Let's talk about that. Piece well, this is you know even within when you, once you finally get to the point in your life, you get to do uh, some of the things you want to do. You yeah, still sure. you still have what you want to do and what you really want to do. Mm -hmm. So um, this piece is uh, this is a um, yellow billed stork, and this piece reverts back to um, how do I describe? I guess. My taxidermy roots would probably mm -hmm. be the expl best explanation. I uh, started collecting books on Victorian taxidermy when I was a kid, and I was reading all these books. Uh, so one thing that was uh, obvious in there was in that at that time they weren't making 
plastic taxidermy mannequins like they do today. Mm -hmm. They would build these elaborate armatures and um, then put the skin over it and stuff straw and rags and all these things in there. Usually the, the result of the taxidermy was pretty horrible. The stuff looked bad, but I was always intrigued by the armatures, the, the structure that would hold this thing up. So um, a few years ago, I started thinking, well, how can I take that idea and create something different with it? So, um, you know, I took this armature idea and, and you know, this is an actual skull mm -hmm. and there's, uh, you know, lots of different parts and pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a friend of mine at the Smithsonian get measurements off of an actual yellow-billed stork study skin they had. So this is still very uh, dimensionally accurate, but I wanted to be minimalist and uh, only, only the amount needed to pull off mm -hmm. the shape and, and the, uh, um, and the, uh, the uh, composition. Uh, but it's using a lot of different ta uh, Victorian taxidermy methods. This is burlap and plaster. Well, I was looking at all the different things you Yeah, there's used, lots of different stuff. There's copper and steel, mm -hmm. there's rope, there's wood, there's, um, you know, and then he's uh, got the little, Excelsior with the fish he's there. Got the little fish in his mouth. But this burlap and plaster, that when they did sculpt mannequins back then or forms, they were cast in burlap and plaster. So this is a traditional not used this way, but, um, and they wouldn't have necessarily done all these things to do a bird, but I'm using those basic techniques to pull off uh, a sculpture in a, in a different way. Because it's still Amazing. all about animals, you know. It, I mean, I do some portrait sculpting and figurative work, but to me it's always sort of been out, out animals and how do you, um, what are the different ways that you can portray animals in uh, three-dimensional form. You mentioned the Smithsonian. Yes. You have some pieces there. Yes. And that is just wonderful. It's amazing. I mean, it is really amazing. Now, what do you have there? What's, well, when, how did that begin? Well, when, the, um, when I had my uh, taxidermy supply company mm -hmm. and we manufactured the mannequins, I did a lot of mounts, a lot of taxidermy, just to get pictures for the catalog, uh, advertising things. So through all that, not necessarily things that I hunted personally, some of it was, but most of it was just pieces that I'd mounted, um, you know, developing products and that sort of thing. So um, when I had uh, friends that worked at the uh, Smithsonian and they were renovating the Mammal Hall, and I'm trying, it's probably been 10 years ago now, and um, I had lots, and this building was full of mounted animals, so I donated um, 300, approximately 300 pieces to the Smithsonian, about 150 mounted pieces and uh, 150 skins or specimens that some of those were mounted that are in the Mammal Hall that you can go see today. Um, and so um, that's always had a connection with them, worked on projects there. I've done, I did sculpture uh, on some of the, uh, the mounts that are in the uh, Smithsonian uh, Natural History in the Mammal Hall at Smithsonian. That is so. awesome. That is wonderful. And one of the reasons that we keep expanding this program to include the various types of art in, uh, that are represented is for people like you that are, it is a totally different art than many people would think about being here. Right. But then you have expanded and your work is in the Smithsonian and other places. And that makes us very proud as a community that uh, you didn't move away from here when you started doing this. You stayed here. Right. And you are from Albemarle, and this is where you are. So far. And we're so far. We're <laughs> proud. Yeah, I know. I know. Time does change. Oh, no. I'm just But kidding. you're like me. As my children say, you couldn't drag my mother no, out of no, Stanley no. County. It is a wonderful place to live, and yeah. one of the things that makes it so wonderful is having the diversity of people right. uh, in here. And I know that you, watching our program today, are really enjoying the new approach to another art form that we are sharing with you today. And we could go on for days. I mean, we could really go on for days because every time I look around the room, I think of something else. But I thank you so much, Roger, for taking the time because I know you're very busy. You're in between travels right now. And uh, for sharing with us and letting us come in one of the questions that I'd like to ask you before we wind this program out is that we mentioned Jeremiah and that was somebody who asked you to do that, a, a mutual friend of ours. If somebody wants something, yes. do they just get in touch with you? Do they call you? Do they email you? Because we can put that information available to our viewers. 
but we know that uh, you are limited in your time, and so what's the approach to do with that? Best, the best thing, uh, Charlotte, is just to go to my website, rogeramartin.com. Right. And uh, a lot of the sculptures on there, a lot of information on there about the sculpture process. Somebody may process. find something they like. Yeah, there, and there's information about the sculpture process Good. and how all this works. But uh, send me an email. Uh, you know, be glad to talk to anyone about it. Well, any there's that. probably somebody's interest is going to be, uh, you know, perked in this. And we will put that at the end of our program. We'll have all the information about your website. And I know there are people that are going to want to know more about the process than we've had time to cover today. Uh, because, uh, you know, that's true with most anything. But I can't thank you enough for uh, sharing with us. And I know we will have footage during the show of other things in your gallery and in your studio upstairs. And, and another thing to mention that we like to talk about is our community, because that's what this program is all about, is this building. Is this is an old, one of the whole old buildings in this town. And you have done a marvelous job with renewing it, re just restoring it, mm -hmm. and yet like keeping it. the beauty of the age and the architecture from that. So uh, this is another way to let people know what we have here. So thank you so yes. much for doing thank this. Thank you very much for coming. It's been our pleasure. Thank you. Hasn't that been wonderful to learn that we have this wonderful gallery and this interesting man in our town who does such beautiful, beautiful work. And as we close out the program, Roger, tell me about this big cat. Now, Charlotte, this is a, a twice, two and a half times life-size uh, sculpture of a bobcat. This was done for a commission piece that I did for the uh, Glen High School in uh, Kernersville. They're the bobcats. Mm -hmm. Well, he's, he's beautiful. He kind of commands you. as you walk in the room, and I think that's amazing. And as we've shared with the, our audience today, the most wonderful stories about these pieces, and I can't thank you enough for doing this. And this is just another way of our saying to the community what talented people we have and what there is to share. It's always my joy and privilege to do the program. I get the easy part. James Cotton does all the difficult work because he does all the producing, he does the editing, and he does the production. And we can't say enough about his talent. And we thank Stanley Community College for giving this to our community. And we know that you like it because you tell us. And I know we're gonna hear a lot about this one, Roger. And at the, on the screen, as we close out the program, it will have your website. You wanna say that for him again? It's uh, rogeramartin.com. And you can look into that website, yes. find out more about the process, the gallery, about Roger. And uh, it, it's just been an, a very, very fascinating program. But most of all, thanks to you, our viewers, because if you didn't watch the program, uh, it wouldn't be worth our doing the program. But we know that people are watching it and they do let us know. So thank you again, folks, and we'll look forward to the next time. Thank you again. And let us know, when you see us, let us know about the program and we will have something good for you again, over and over again. Now, don't forget, you can go to YouTube and watch the pro previous programs, Stanley TV, and you can go to on channel 21 if you have that available to you because there's always a program schedule running so there's quite a few ways and as i did recently i sent the link to a friend of mine in uh, pennsylvania who said she wanted to see one of our programs and so when i sent the link she can see them all thanks again it's a joy to do this